We're going to talk today about irrigation, some of the work that we've been doing out here at the station and elsewhere. And one of the first questions that came up this year was, uh, we had it start out a pretty good year, pretty normal, and then we had that drought early. Farmers were struggling, running around, trying to lay out poly pipe, and it was concerned about when do you start waterings. We completed a study on that, and I wanted to share some of our results with you, first of all, and which we were looking at delaying irrigation. We had a delays of 0, 5, 10, and 15 day delay, and see what effect that has on yield. And in this field here, we had three maturity groups that we were studying uh, with those treatments. And then across the road, we had a maturity group four that we were looking at on a clay soil. We're using the Arkansas Irrigation Scheduler Computer Program as our uh, basis for scheduling the irrigation. It is a program based upon a reference evapotranspiration or water consumption uh, and a crop coefficient based upon the growth stage of the crop and take into account daily high temperatures. You can uh, download that on the internet at the Extension website and many of you have done that. And so we use that as a basis for scheduling irrigation and, and re real quick some of the findings of that study uh, in uh, 2009 uh, on this side here, uh, we were all over the, the spectrum with it, but our maturity group three was hit pretty hard with a 15-day delay in starting irrigation. These are usually uh, quicker maturing varieties. Maturity group four, we saw the same pattern. Uh, and I might add that three and four are indeterminate varieties. They flower a little bit differently. We had our maturity group five, uh, we didn't see any significant effect in 2009 and 2010 we didn't see any significant effect on a delay a delay of 15 days on that uh, maturity group four we saw a little depression but it wasn't significant maturity group three we did see in 2010 a depression in yields with a delay of uh, 15 days and the data was jumped all over the place on the clay soil you can see there it dropped down pretty quick uh, for the maturity group four in 2009. Uh, 2010 we kind of saw the same trend uh, but when you're talking about <coughs> delaying irrigation and some of these recommendations it's it's there's not a lot of consistency you're just playing the odds that's just farming in general you're just playing the odds trying to get the odds in your favor and so to summarize those studies in two and nine years uh, we had a depression of yields with a five-day delay. Uh, in six of nine maturity group soil years, we had a depression in yields uh, with a 15-day delay. So a week is not going to, if you're off a week early, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, you stretch out two weeks, then you're going to look at maybe a uh, possibility of reduced yields, particularly with the early maturing uh, group three varieties. They come on and they reach those critical growth stages uh, sooner than the others. Now I gave you a handout that's got some information on it. Uh, the first side shows the uh, uh, description of the growth stages and uh, on the back shows uh, some average chronology of different growth stages during the reproductive modes for our region. And I want to point out that the critical time for watering uh, is during the reproductive growth stages, particularly from R3 to R5. Any moisture stress a crop gets from R3 to R5, you're going to get uh, yields hammered more than any other time. And so when it comes to irrigating soybeans from R3 to R5, you don't want to get behind. You want to stay on top of the game as best as you can. It's been a really rough year up until last week. Uh, it was good to see the rains come. A lot of farmers were able to go home and see what their families look like. They've been running around 24 hours a day, it seems like water and fields. This was a dry, very abnormal year we were having. Uh, when it comes to uh, when to stop, we generally recommend R65. We've uh, had another study out here on this site uh, before this one and uh, again playing the odds. In many years uh, we were getting a yield with an extra watering up until R65 we were getting a yield enhancement 
Uh, it wasn't consistent, but the odds were that you could get it. How does that relate because to uh, the, the plant? The uh, if you look at this uh, growth stages at R5, you've only got about 15% of your seeds in, on the stalk, uh, and at, between R6 and R7, you've got the rest of it. So at R65, you only got about half of your crop on the stalk. And then it goes uh, the other half after that. A lot of that weight comes from remobilization. Soybeans pack in carbon and nitrogen up until about R65, and then they start, they store it in the petioles and in the stalks, and then they begin to relocate that into the seeds. So it's very critical to have uh, good conditions up until that time so they can move that into seed yields. And so, R3 is very critical. When you're setting pods, if soybeans get under stress, they'll start dropping flowers and pods just like cotton does when it gets under stress. So it's very critical to stay up with the irrigation at that time. All right. Now this study we have here, we're looking at different uh, methods of irrigation. And uh, we've been using Arkansas Schedulers computer program. It's based on high temperatures. And so we're looking at some other methods that are more direct, more on-site, and take account into the weather variability. Over to your left is a weather station uh, that calculates uh, what we call a reference evapotranspiration uh, using a revised pimlin monteith equation, a very accurate equation. And it basically gives the uh, water consumption of a reference, which we call is defined as a well-watered grass sod six inches tall. And then we base everything uh, in relation to that, to that reference ET. The, your irrigation schedule program is based on a average ETs. Uh, this one measures directly on the field every hour. It's measuring humidity, light, wind speed, temperatures, and it's got a form that it calculates. Very accurate. Uh, and soybeans, from some of the data that we've collected here on this site, this shows the percentage of the crop moisture use in, in regard or in reference to the uh, potential evapotranspiration and what we call the KC, the coefficient of crop is with uh, water consumption. <coughs> and uh, this shows the uh, results of last year. We had, a, we had a maturity group four and five. We're looking at the difference between determinants and indeterminants. And uh, starting at the growing seed, you can see that early in the, in the soybeans when they're small, the coefficients ranges from about 0.3 up to about 0.55 and then when you start to approach reproductive growth it just shoots up and really start to use uh, moisture out of the soil very big demand it just I mean it just very dramatic this generally occurs around R2 or when you get canopy closure which is I define as 95 percent or more canopy and when that occurs as far as I'm concerned the moisture consumption of soybeans is, is about identical to our reference uh, moisture consumption. So, in fact, we had some data, and Dr. Purcell had a graduate student had some data showing that it, uh, in really high demand environments, it can even exceed uh, the moisture of our reference. And so, I say when you when you hit R2 or you hit 95% canopy, whatever comes first, you got peak moisture demand by soybean crop up until about R65. So that's when you want to be on top of the game. Any uh, stress during that time from moisture is, go is going to really hammer your yield. So <clears throat> in this study, we're looking at different methods of scheduling irrigation. We're trying to get something that's more on site, that's user friendly. And so we were looking at uh, scheduling irrigation using these soil moisture sensors. These are watermark moisture sensors that we're using. This is what they look like. Uh, they measure moisture in the soil up to uh, 200 centibar tension. And we've got them at different depths out here. And we use a target uh, to determine when to turn the water on. And on a silt loam soil, <coughs> that target was uh, 60 centibars and clay soil 50 centibars. I'm not too happy with these. There's too much variability in them across the field. And we've had trouble getting moisture down into subsoil, and I found them not to be very practical. Also, I found that if you don't flag them, you can't remember where they are, and the combine finds them later on. This is a new gadget that we're looking at. 
uh, in addition to uh, the scheduler, we've got that treatment out here. These, this is a commercially available ET gauge. It's a at, what they call an atmometer, and the way this thing works, you mount it up on a post, fill it with distilled water, you set your target, and it wicks water up to the ceramic top, and it's got a fabric on it that simulates the surface of a leaf. And we find very good correlation with the moisture loss in this and our reference ET. So the way it would work if you're using this for scheduling, uh, you would fill it up and mark the the water meniscus and then you would lower this uh, ring down to whatever your deficit target is. In a soybean production handbook we recommend uh, one and three quarter inches for silt loam soils with a pan. Uh, for silt loam soils without a pan the target's two and a half inches. For clay soils two inches. And so in this soil here it's a silt loam soil without a pan. We would have two and a half inches and when the water drops down to two and a half inches if it doesn't rain uh, then it's time uh, to water okay this is my first public appearance of the tub gauge I've been getting a lot of curiosity over the tub gauge but this is an open pan evaporation method that uh, we've developed and I'm introducing it the first time I've been amazed at how accurate this thing is it's user friendly you just fill it up with water. It works from three to eight inches. Uh, it's got this uh, two by four inch mesh over it to keep predators out and, and it floats up and down. When it rains, it adjusts itself. You don't have to fool with it. The ET gauge, if it rains an inch, you gotta move that thing down an inch. You can drive by the road 30 miles an hour on a four wheeler and tell whether you need to water or not. The way, you, what, the way it works, you set your deficit with this a uh, little pin here and then when it drops down when it hits the red it's time to water and the reason I kept it a secret because I knew everybody would laugh at me <laughs> and I wasn't sure if it worked but these things have to be calibrated but there's no secret pan evaporation correlates to a reference about well, transpiration a lot of literature shows that uh, this is data this year and it's it's tracking with last year I want you to notice that uh, one thing right here this blue this blue line is the cumulative ET of our weather station. Now look at the tub. Here's the tub, purple. I mean, it's right on track with our reference. Pretty good. I was really amazed. Uh, the ET gauges aren't too far off. The scheduler was overestimating moisture consumption, and that has to do because it's just using daily high temperatures. And to give you an example, last week, and all that cloudy weather, we had two days where the weather station said we had zero, zero moisture use. Our ET gauge and the tub were saying the same thing, but the scheduler was saying we were using 0.26 inches. But see, the scheduler didn't take into account rain and humidity and drizzly weather and that kind of thing. So I've been really pleased with the tub. It's kind of redneck looking, but it works. That cost $300. Uh, thirty dollars into this thing here, so now you just know what it is. So quit making jokes of me as I'm driving down the highway with these in my, the back of my truck. 